أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد So this is our third session we are looking at the tafsir of surah nuh which is chapter 71 of the Quran and the last time we completed verse 4 um, so we begin with a new set of verses which is from verse 5 onwards and uh, what we shall do is try and look at verse um, 5 to 9 as, 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 as a set um, and the previous verses was essentially um, the prophet Nuh's uh, initial admonitions and summons to his people inviting them to worship one God and uh, asking them to give up their evil ways uh, with this set of verse we see an initial lament from Nuh he now changes his direction instead of addressing his people he's now addressing his Lord he's ex addressing God and we shall see after these verses he will turn his attention again to the people where we shall see a more detailed discourse with his people and then he will turn his attention back to Allah again and we will see again a more detailed lament to Allah so this is sort of an initial lament to Allah in which he says Qala Rabbi inni da'utu qawmi laylan wa nahara he said my Lord indeed I have summoned my people night and day falam yazidhum du'a'i illa firara but my summons only increased only increases their evasion وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ Indeed, whenever I summoned them so that you might forgive them, جَعَلُوا أَصَابِئَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَصَرُّوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارًا They put their fingers into their ears and they draw their cloaks over their heads and they were persistent in their unfaith and disdainful in their arrogance. ثُمَّ إِنِّي دَعَوْتُهُمْ جِهَارًا Again, I summoned them aloud. ثُمَّ إِنِّي أَعْلَنْتُ لَهُمْ And again, I appealed to them publicly. وَأَسْرَرْتُ لَهُمْ إِسْرَارًا And I confided with them privately. And what he insisted on telling them night and day, we shall see in the next set of verses. But we now want to just look at these uh, verses of um, lament. The first thing we observe from verse 5 is when he says قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِ لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا We see that in his complaints, if you look at the whole surah, Nuh salam or Noah, the prophet Noah, at no point is he lamenting about himself or his own suffering. It is always about the people not accepting the truth. It is always about the people refusing to accept his message. So you need to keep that in perspective because when you look at the whole surah, you might get an impression, well, he's lamenting too much compared to the other prophets. But look more closely, you will see it's never about, oh Allah, they throw stones or rocks at me. Oh Allah, they call, you know, they do this to me, or they do that to me, or they, they, they threaten to kill me. It's never about his own suffering. And we know from elsewhere in the Quran, he has preached to them for 950 years. This is some, uh, 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 something that is agreed upon even by the Christians and the Jews in the Bible or the Torah as well. They have the 950 years. So it's always about uh, uh, the people. Uh, what is it he is summoning to them? We had seen as well earlier, uh, briefly in verse 3, where he said to them, um, Worship God, be wary of him, and obey me. Night and day, he mentions night and day. This night and day could be in the literal sense that he used to go out preaching to them in the night and during the daytime. But it can also be understood metaphorically to say constantly that he was persistent in his, um, in his preaching. Um, Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi, uh, in his tafsir of this surah, he says 
he talks of how he admires the, the perseverance, the patience, and, and the, the steadfastness of Nuh. He says, it is said in, in hist historic sources that after preaching for 950 years, Nuh managed to get 80 followers only. 80. He says, if you divide 950 by 80, on average, he preached for 12 years to convert one person. Okay? And so he says, if we had that kind of sincerity, there was no reason why the whole world would not have been following Islam and worshipping one God. Twelve years to preach for one person, right? Whereas we would give up um, even if, uh, you know, we were converting one person or guiding one person every uh, month, for example. Okay? So, um, there are also some narrations that go into details to say that this night and day was literal. That when they used to evade him, he would go to their homes in the night and he would knock on the door and wait for them to say, who is it? And when he, they would say, when he would reply, uh, he knew if he would say, I am Nuh, they would tell him, go away. So he would knock on the door, this is one riwaya. Um, and when the homeowner would say, who is at the door? He would say, I am Nuh, say there is no God but Allah. Like immediately, right? From behind the door as well. فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارَ But my summons only increases their evasion. Now this verse is very, very interesting. Why is it interesting? Because this is a prophet of God who is summoning them. You, we could understand if Nuh would have said that my summons did not make any difference. He says my summon, not only does it not make any difference, it increases them in their evasion. It makes them even more hard-hearted. They turn away even further from me. This proves that guidance does not come to a human being from an external source. Okay? Uh, regardless of how pure that may be. That source might be the prophet of Islam. The prof that, that source might be an imam. That source may be the Quran. It doesn't matter how pure the source might be. It does not have the ability to guide a human being. Guidance will come from that human being within when they have the uh, um, capacity or the, 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 the willingness to take that guidance. What the external source does is it just provides an impetus. It, it sort of just lights a spark. It just um, gives an encouragement, if you like. But true guidance or hidayah comes from um, the human being within and obviously this light of faith that comes from the heart of the sincere uh, we want to prove that from the Quran that it is only when a person's heart is pure enough that they will and sincere enough that they will be able to take from that uh, pure source a simple example would be just a receptacle <coughs> one of the purest forms of water would be rain okay just because rain is pure, if it falls into a container or a receptacle, does not mean it will purify that receptacle. It will depend on that receptacle. If the receptacle is rusty, for example, that rain water will give out a stench. Okay? But if that rain water was to fall on roses, for example, it will give out a fragrance. Which means that the rainwater in itself does not have the stench or the fragrance. It is the recipient that takes that clean or pure source and then what it produces or how it reacts to that guidance because water a lot of time in the Quran is, is related to uh, um, guidance. And there are verses that show that, that we should look at uh, um, some other time. But if the container is corrupt then what you will end up getting is the container is black, the source is pure or white. When it mixes, you will not get black, you will not get white, you will get gray, which will be a confusion. And that is why you will find even in the history of Islam, more dangerous than those who were open enemies of Islam and were non-Muslims, were those Muslims who had confused ideas about Islam. 
because their heart was neither black nor white, it was gray. So they had the knowledge, but they didn't have the faith. And so they had the ability to now use the Quran to confuse people. And there are examples of people like this in history who memorized the whole Quran, who knew a tremendous amount of hadith, but they would misguide people because of uh, you know, the, the heart being impure. Look at, for example, um, let's look at some examples of how this works. Look at chapter 17, verse 82, okay, which is Surah Al-Isra, uh, or Surah Bani Israel. Um, and uh, Allah is talking about the Quran. He says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we send down in the Quran that which is a cure and a mercy for the faithful. That means this Quran is a cure for your illnesses and it is a mercy for the faithful. But, وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارَ And this Quran increases the wrongdoers only in loss. It doesn't say that this Qur'an is of no benefit to the wrongdoers. No, no, it's not just it doesn't have no effect. It has an effect. It increases them in their loss. Okay? Which is very uh, um, interesting. Or, for example, look at uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the, the longest surah in the Qur'an, chapter 2. And if you look at verse um, 26, you see that Allah gives a parable and after he gives the parable he says further in the middle of this verse he says يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا these parables that Allah gives many are misguided by it and many are guided by it the same parable right? But then he tells us whom it misguides. وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ He leads no one astray with these parables except the transgressors. Okay. And I've given these examples before in other lectures as well. To say when the sun shines, it's the same heat, it's the same light. When it falls on a piece of butter, it melts it. But when it falls on on grass or on straw, it dries it and hardens it and makes it hay. Right? So you cannot say the source or the sun is what hardens or softens. Because it does not discriminate and say, I'm going to soften the butter but I'm going to harden the hay or whatever. Right? It is the same sun, the same heat, the same temperature. But the effect it has depends on the recipient. So Allah does not discriminate and say, I'm going to guide this person and I'm going to misguide this person. Especially we the Shia, we do not believe in this idea of predestination where Allah has predetermined that you're going to heaven or hell. Okay? It is you who will decide that when the Quran comes to you, does it increase you in faith or does it increase you in doubt? All right? And this having a pure heart before you are able to take guidance is so important that uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, the same chapter, in verse 129, uh, the Prophet uh, Abraham or Ibrahim alayhi salam, he, when he leaves his son Ismail in Mecca, he prays to Allah that from these descendants of Ismail, they should come a prophet to guide the people of Mecca, which is the final prophet. And Ibrahim's dua is, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasulan minhum. Our Lord raise amongst them an apostle from among them. Yatlu alayhim ayatik, who should recite to them your signs. Wa yu'allimuhumul kitaba wal hikmah. And teach them the book and wisdom. Wa yuzakkihim. And purify them. Okay, You see the order in which Ibrahim mentions. Ibrahim says, send a prophet amongst them who will recite to them your signs, who will teach them the book and wisdom, and who will purify them. Now when you go to Surah Al-Jum'ah, which is chapter 62, um, 
and you look at verse 2, Allah answers the dua, the prayer of Ibrahim. But when he answers the prayer of Ibrahim, he reverses the words of Ibrahim. He says, He it is God who sent uh, to the unlettered people an apostle from amongst themselves. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi to recite to them his signs wa yuzakkihim and to purify them wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal hikmah and to teach them the book and wisdom so ibrahim had said send them a prophet to teach them the book and the wisdom and to purify them allah says i will do it but i will send him to purify them and then teach them the book and the wisdom okay which means we must first ensure that there is some level of purity in our hearts before we can take knowledge and wisdom and it has an effect on our lives. And even as Muslims, even as Shias, we will find that if we stop focusing on self-growth, on self-purification, on tazkiyah to nafs, what is called tazkiyah to nafs, right? There comes a point, regardless of how religious we may be, there comes a point where no matter how much we read in hadith or Quran, it does not seem to take us to the next level. We just seem to be accumulating knowledge, attending more symposiums, more conferences, reading more tafsir, more hadith, attending lectures, but nothing changes. Why? Because the heart needs to be prepared further before that knowledge has an effect on it. Okay? So, this is a very important concept, and obviously we can talk about it for a long time. Uh, but I'll just give you one final example, and then we move on. Um, so this one, I was comparing it with 62.2, okay, which is from Surah Al-Jum'ah. And uh, now we look at Surah At-Tawbah, which is 9, 124 and 125. And... Uh, here we see again a similar example um, 124 okay Allah says uh, whenever a surah is sent down there are some of them who say which of you did it increase in faith ayyukum zadatu hadhihi imanan which means that those polytheists in Mecca whose hearts were hard, who didn't want to receive the truth, they used to make fun of the Quran. So when the Quran would be revealed, they would sort of tease the Prophet, peace be on him and his family and the Muslims. And in teasing him, they would mock and say to one another, which of you has this increased in faith? Now Allah responds to that. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَهُمْ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ as for those who have faith, it increases them in their faith and they rejoice. Okay? Just imagine today, sometimes we recite the Quran, we open just a random surah, we recite a verse, and we're totally blown away by the verse, isn't it? I'm sure you've all experienced that. You read something in the Quran and it sort of melts your heart. You feel so close to Allah. You feel delighted. You're sitting, you stand up, you say, Subhanallah, what a verse, right? Now imagine those Muslims in whose midst it was being revealed for the first time. Okay? There are verses that talk about how when they would hear the verses, they would start crying and weeping and they would fall down into prostration and they would increase in faith and say, surely this cannot be from a human being. This cannot be forged. This has to be from the Lord of the universe. Right? So as for those who have faith, it increases them in faith and they rejoice. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ As for those in whose heart is a disease, is a sickness, فَزَادَتْهُمْ رِجْسًا إِلَىٰ رِجْسِهِمْ It only adds defilement to their defilement. In other words, they have already rids. They have impurity in their hearts. This same verse that increases the faith of the faithful, it increases the rids of those who have rids in their heart. وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ And they die while they are faithless. Okay? So we see from all these examples that the Qur'an actually, not only does it have zero effect, but it actually has a negative effect on people whose hearts have a disease. It increases their misguidance. It leads them further astray. It increases the disease in their heart. 
Okay. And this is, yes. في قلوبهم مرض فزاء دهم الله مرضا. Okay. And there are, of course, there is a whole explanation to that how Allah increases them. Why would Allah increase disease in someone's heart and so on? But uh, if time permits, then we can address that during Q&A. But uh, um, so, so coming back to Surah Nuh, you now see what exactly Nuh is saying to, to Allah. He is saying to them, I summon my people day and night. فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا But my summons does not increase them except in their evasion. They just continue to, the more I preach to them, the more they evade, them, evade me. Now, uh, that was verse 6. Verse 7, he says, Indeed, whenever I summon them, that you might forgive them, they put their fingers into their ears. And they draw their cloaks over their heads. And they are persistent. وَأَصَرُّ okay? Israr, basically. They are persistent in being unfaithful. وَاسْتَكْبَرُ istikbara, And they have this istikbara from kibr, from takabbur. They are disdainful in their arrogance. In other words, it's their arrogance which stops them. And later on, when, we, when, when the surah develops and we come to the mention of the idols, and we talk about the history of idol worship and how it came about, we shall continuously see how arrogance is one of the main reasons why a person refuses guidance. Okay? The difference between a person who takes guidance and a person who refuses guidance is always humility, sincerity versus arrogance and hypocrisy. Okay? Whether you take it at the level of accepting God or whether you take it even at the level of accepting our mistakes. If I see someone, let, let me reverse this. If someone sees me doing wudu incorrectly, or praying incorrectly, and he comes and corrects me, and says to me, Brother Khalil, very politely, don't be offended, but you were doing this, you know, it's actually not the right way to do it, and here's Ayatollah Sistani's fatwa, okay. What will my reaction be? That will depend on whether I am sincere and humble or whether I am insincere and proud. My ability to take guidance. If I am sincere and humble, not only will I change, but I will thank him. I will say, you saved my hereafter. How can I reward you? I will hug him. But if I am insincere and proud, I'll, I'll you know, thank you, walk away, or are you sure? or mind your own business, or you know, that sort of thing. So we lose out, and in fact destroy our hereafter because of pride. So we shall see about this pride. Now, وَاسْتَغْشَوْ is from al ghishawa This is when they, when they cover themselves with their cloaks. It's actually to envelope or to veil something, and it is used in other parts of the Quran. But uh, that is more of interest to, to, to um, those who look at it from an Arabic uh, grammar perspective. But the verses that were, the, the part where Nu says, so that you may forgive them, is important because it shows what was the goal of Nu. Okay? Even though <clears throat> towards the end of the surah we shall see he curses people, most of the people who are misguided, and he prays for their destruction. Um, and we shall see that even when he curses, he gives a reason why he is cursing them. And it will not be out of hate or anger. But. Uh, here we see that his preaching was out of kindness. It was to save them. And that's why he says, whenever I summoned them, so that you may forgive them. Okay? They would do this. They would put their fingers in the ears. Now, they would put their fingers in the ears means, to, means they would, the reason they would do that would be to stop the words of Nuh from reaching their ears. Okay? And you've seen sometimes children, when they're playing, they will do that. If the children have a fight, and one child is saying something, and the other one doesn't want to listen, they'll put their fingers in the ears and say, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I'm not, that sort of a thing, right? So they put their fingers in the ears because they don't want to listen to the words of no. They cover themselves. Now, they cover themselves could be two reasons. One reason could be that they want no not to recognize them. 
Because if he recognizes me, he will call me. Then you start preaching to me. So to evade him. Because he says every time I preach to them, they increase in their evasion. So when they see him from far, oh, there comes the man who's going to tell me to worship one God. Cover myself. Change my road. That's one reason. Another reason could be that some of them hated him so much out of disgust. I don't want to see his face. Okay. They would um, cover themselves. Now, the, the uh, Mufassirun say that actually if you look at um, chapter 14 verse 9, I won't read that, but you can look at that at your own time. It says that besides blocking their ears and covering themselves, it says they would put their hands into their mouths. Okay. Now, you might generally assume that because Nuh was one of the early prophets when mankind was in its infancy, therefore even human beings in their evil, they were childlike in their evil. And because of the childishness, they would do things like put fingers in their ears and cover themselves, which today pre people would just maybe swear at you and tell you to you know, um, go take a hike sort of a thing. But putting their hands in their mouth doesn't make sense. You know, if he's preaching to them, why would they put their hands in their mouth? So some of the ulama say that all these things are actually not literal. They're actually metaphoric. What it means by saying put their fingers in their ears, cover their clock, is to say basically they would not listen to him. They would hide from him, evade him, you know, not come into contact with him. And put their hands into their mouth would mean they would not reply him. When he would talk to them, they would just ignore him. Or in this same verse 14.9, it says, besides putting their hands in their mouth, it says, they would say to him, we disbelieve in what you have been sent with. So they would go from not just telling him, you know, we don't believe you're a prophet of God, and we don't believe your message, but they would say, even if God has sent you and you are a prophet, we disbelieve in what you have been sent with. Okay. Um, and I'd mentioned the last time that I wanted you to think about how this can be equated to present times. And some of the ulama have also tried to relate this to say that those groups, whether at an individual level or an organizational level, who are opposed to the truth, who are opposed to Islam, who do not want true guidance and truth to reach people, they will use other means to stop guidance from reaching people. But those means will be very similar to this same idea. What is the idea? The idea is that people can only think about things when information comes into their minds, but information comes to their minds through their eyes and their ears. So if you don't want someone to know the truth, it's too late to try and influence him after the truth has gotten into his mind. What you need to do is stop it from reaching his eyes and his ears or distort what reaches his eyes and his ears or present something else that is more attractive that will uh, um, distract that individual from paying attention to the truth. And that is where the media comes. That is why, for example, Islam um, uh, tells Muslims not to um, listen to music, for example, particularly the types of music um, that are loud and that are meaningless and that have no value. The early ulama used to say music is haram, period. Now there is this whole debate of halal music, haram music. I don't want to get into that. Um, I'm old school in that fashion. But essentially music distracts you from truth. Truth will only be heard where there is no you know, loud drums and noise and all that. And you will see that the media does this a lot to try and distract us. Okay? There was a time, for example, when you might have had an opportunity to meet a stranger. You're sitting on the bus, you sit next to a stranger, you might have a chance to ask the stranger, hello, how are you, where are you from, I'm from here, you're from there, this is my name. You know, talk a little bit, find out, where do you go. And slowly you might build a relationship, and at some point if you meet on the bus every day, you might start talking about religion, 
and slowly you might mention, oh, I'm a Muslim and this is a mosque we go to and you know, you're welcome. They might tell you about their religion. You might give them something to think about. They may give you something to think about, right? But today when you sit on the bus, what happens? Everybody has an iPod or whatever stuck in their ears and they have shades. So the eyes are covered. You can't communicate through eyes. The ears are sealed, right? You go through the subway, you go through the bus, you walk on the streets. Everyone's just down with ears are sealed, eyes are sealed. Which means what? You can't get to me. Whether it's fear, whether it's not wanting to, it may have started with, you know, not wanting to be approached or talked to by, you know, individuals who may intend harm. Particularly in the case of women, they may not want some man to sort of uh, try and attract their attention. So when you do that, you now are in the world, but in your own world, isn't it? And so these are things that uh, um, we, we need to think about. You look at, for example, um, chapter 76, verse 2, um, which is uh, Surah Al-Dahr, right? Surah Al-Insan, where Allah talks about the creation of uh, human beings. And what he does is, he says, as soon as he talks about, he talks about in creating men, inna khalaqna al-insana min nutfatin amshajin nabtali, we created a human being from a drop of life germ so that we may test him. Now Allah says, we created the human being so that we may test him. In order that we may test him, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا basira. So we made him a creature that listens and sees. So we made him endowed with hearing and sight. Okay? So hearing and sight are very, very important. These are blessings of Allah that we take for granted. When you have some time alone, just think about this for a moment. That if one day you woke up and you were blind and deaf, you can talk, you can smell, but you're blind and you're deaf, what would your world be like? you would totally be lost. First of all, you can't see, so you don't know who's in front of you. You wouldn't be able to write anything for anyone to tell them what's happening to you. Then if people were trying to talk to you to say what's happening to you, you can't hear them. So even if you can talk, what are you going to say? You, you don't, there's nothing coming in, there's nothing going out, right? You would just go raving mad, right? So these two um, sources of taking in um, information are, are really very, very important. And this is what Nuh is complaining about. And uh, that is why also, if you look at uh, um, chapter 7, um, verse 179, and I'll just read the English here that I have, it says, they have hearts with which they do not understand, eyes with which they do not see, ears with which they do not hear. They are like cattle, ulaika kal an'am, balhum adal, rather they are more astray. Okay? So again, Allah is pointing to this fact, that when you have eyes, you look but you do not see. When you have ears, you hear but you don't listen. Then we become like cattle, or even worse, because the cattle hasn't been blessed with the intellect to reason. Okay? And that is why, again, when Allah condemns people who do not apply reason, He uses summun, bukmun, umyun, fahum la yaqilun. As for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 171, He says, deaf, dumb, and blind, they do not apply reason. Okay? So, um, those of you who are into marketing and all, I'm sure you know the importance of media and eyes and ears and how people are influenced. Um, we also want to mention here very quickly that, of course, the real problem is not the eyes and the ears, but the heart. The reason they put their fingers in the ears and cover themselves, it starts with the heart. And that is why in chapter 22, verse 46, Allah clarifies this and says, Indeed, it is not the eyes that turn blind, but the hearts that turn blind. Okay. Okay. Now, 
Um, I want to end the discussion on this verse by just showing you some strong parallels or comparisons between Nuh and um, the final prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. So you have Nuh and you have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. And what we can see from this as well is how history repeats itself. Nuh is very early on. He is actually called Adam Uthani, the second Adam. Because the world sort of restarted with him. It's almost like someone pressed a reset button, right? Um, and I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, we see in this surah that uh, uh, in verse 6 of this surah, Nu complains that uh, when I summon them, it only increases them in their evasion. Okay? Uh, we see in the case of the final prophet in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 13, um, there is a mention again of the people at that time that they only sought to flee. The words in that verse is they only sought to flee. Okay, so the idea of running away from the truth. Uh, Nuh, in this verse that we just looked at, verse 7, he says to Allah that I only invited them so that you may forgive them. But they run away, they cover themselves and put their fingers in the ears and they're persistent and he says, وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا stikbara," And they're disdainful in their arrogance. Okay. Um, if you look at Surah Al-Munafiqoon, which is chapter 63, verse 5, uh, uh, I mean verse 5 of Surah Al-Munafiqoon, it says that... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ would tell the hypocrites in his time. He would say to them, come that Allah's messenger may plead forgiveness for you. Okay. When they are told, come so that the messenger of Allah may plead forgiveness for you, they twist their heads and you see them turn away while they are disdainful. Yastaghfir lakum Rasulullah, lawa ru'usahum wa ra'aytahum mustakbirin. You will see them that they turn away and they are proud in the same, same manner. And then Nuh complains in this verse that the people would put fingers in their ears and draw clocks over their head. Okay, which is again this, this same verse. Um, in the case of um, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a couple of verses. One is chapter 41, verse 26. It says that when he would preach in public, they would try to drown his voice down. And they would say, now this is chapter 41, verse 26, they would say, do not listen to this Quran and hoot it down so that you may prevail. Basically make so much noise that people should not listen to what this, uh, this man is saying. And again in, in chapter 11, verse 5, the example of uh, putting clocks over their heads is given for Rasulullah as well. So you see history repeating itself um, in the same manner. And in fact, uh, it goes even beyond the revelation of the Quran. Right? We know, for example, in the tragedy of Karbala, that when Imam Hussain was preaching to the forces of Yazid, okay, the same thing happened. When he started arguing with them and they saw that now they had no argument against his reasoning. When he stood before them and said to them, am I not the grandson of your prophet? Am I not the son of the daughter of your prophet? Have I done anything wrong in Islam? Have I done anything that for which I deserve to be killed? Is my blood law? And he kept preaching to them. What did they start doing? They started, they said, bring the drums. They started beating drums. Why? Because they didn't want the rest of the army who are now perhaps listening, what is this man saying? You know, Yazid has been telling us and Muawiyah has been telling us that he is not the grandson of the Prophet, that this and that. Muawiyah was calling himself Rasulullah. Right? So they, some of them may not have known the truth. So they started beating drums so that they would drown the voice of Hussein. And you will find this persistent and consistent in history. Okay. 
So we move on to verse uh, um, 8. And uh, of course, Nuh continues to say, Thumma inni da'autuhum jihara, which is again the same thing. Jihara is actually a calling out at the top of one's voice. In Arabic, when you call out, it is called nida. Okay? And, and uh, what the Mufassirun say is to call out jiharan is to call out really aloud at the top of your voice, like to stand at, at a hilltop or a mountain and then really call out. Again, the way Rasulullah used to do, he would stand on the mountains of Safa, for example, and he would call out and say, Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Say there is no God but one, you will be saved. Right? Um, and then verse 9, he says that he would call out to them, Thumma inni a'alantu lahum wa asrartu lahum israra. And again, I would appeal to them publicly and confide with them privately. So he is again essentially very, very persistent. And the ulama have tried to explain this both in the literal and metaphoric sense to say that you could say that his tabligh or his preaching went through three phases. If you interpret these verses literally, you could say that Nuh's preaching went through three phases, that he first preached to them individually and privately night and day, and then he began, they began evading him. So when they began evading him, he began preaching aloud. And then in, in public, which would be verse 8, and then he started using both methods publicly and privately. Okay? Or you could simply look at it metaphorically and say publicly and privately are opposites. Night and day are opposites. So what he's essentially saying is I exhausted every means possible and any possible means you can imagine I tried to use, I approached them in groups, individually, at all times, but they have simply refused and with, uh, um, I have been met with no success. So we come to, this is basically the, the, the second segment that we looked at. But now it's a detailed explanation as compared to verse 1 to 4. Okay? And this will run from verse 10 to verse 20. Before he will turn again to Allah and start lamenting in, in detail. Okay? And that's where 20, 21 onwards is where we will see him cursing the people and the discussion on the idols as well. So verse 10, Nuh tells us that فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I said to them, plead to your Lord for forgiveness. Indeed, he is all forgiving. If you plead forgiveness from your Lord, what will he do? يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He will send for you abundant rains from the sky. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And aid you with wealth and children or sons. وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ And provide you with gardens. وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا And provide you with streams. Okay? And then it continues. But I want to look at these first 10 to 12 as a segment. Um, for those of you who are interested in Arabic, إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا غَفَّارًا is the... Uh, superlative, it's the mubalagha of al ghafur So Allah is all forgiving, ghafur But when you stress that and you uh, um, you you put that at a higher level, it is ghafara, meaning very very forgiving. Okay, and uh, ghafara actually is one who covers or hides your mistakes or your sins. Okay, um, we have the word ghafr, for example. Ghafr is a veil, like sitr. Okay. There are some riwayat that says that um, paradise is under the arsh of Allah, and across the hall of paradise there is a canopy that shades the inhabitants of paradise. And that canopy is called a mighfar, from the same word. Just so you understand the context of this. Um, so when you ask Allah for maghfirah, or you say astaghfirullah or istighfar. What you're asking him to do is to cover your misdeeds. Okay. Uh, 
and he tells them plead to Allah for forgiveness indeed he is all forgiving now again for those interested in Arabic he says innahu kana ghaffara kana okay kana ghaffara um, the word kana is actually in itself in the past tense it means he was okay but the Quran uses kana also to show uh, what is called dawam or continuity okay always and there are many other verses in the Quran where you will find that Allah uses the past tense even for the future okay uh, so you have to it's a whole detailed discussion those of you who have attended my Arabic class before you understand that the past tense in Arabic is also the perfect tense and the present tense is the uh, imperfect tense which means in Arabic there is no future tense as such you can express future tense by adding some particles but as such when you want to show something in perfection uh, something that might not stop then you have to express it in the past tense that is why for example when we recite the aqd for marriage between a man and a woman in Islam even though we are reciting those vows right now we say them in the past tense right we say ankahtu muakilati which literally means I married my client to your client right or zawajtu zawajtu is I married like it's in the past tense but fi'lul maadi the past tense is used to show uh, perfection and something that is uh, not there's no chance of it not happening okay uh, similarly for example uh, in surah al imran for example in surah al imran if you look at verse 110 allah says kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas you are uh, the best ummah that has been brought forth from mankind and there is a whole discussion on who is this ummah okay but from an arabic perspective kuntum Okay. Kuntum is actually you were. It's actually you were. You are would have been antum. Right? But Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummati. So again, that doesn't mean that it was only you know some companions in the past were the best nation, and now Allah is talking in the past tense. So in that same sense, in the hukana ghaffara. It's not indeed he was all forgiving. It means indeed he is always, and there is no doubt that he would ever not be all forgiving. And if you plead for forgiveness, Yursilis Sama'a alaykum midrara. He will send down abundant rains for you from the sky. Now, when you look at it from an Arabic perspective, rains are not mentioned. What is actually mentioned, the literal translation is he will send the sky down on you. Yusilis sama'a alaykum midrara. But the Mufassirun all understand that in Arabic literature, sama can mean uh, rain in the right context. And there's lots of examples in early poetry as well in Arabic to show that uh, instead of saying ma as sama, the water of the skies, just sama is used. All right? And basically, there is no uh, disagreement amongst any of the Mufassirun on this that Sama here would mean uh, rains. Now, um, what I want us to discuss very quickly and then maybe we'll stop here is um, the relationship of asking for forgiveness with the rains. Okay. What is this relationship? Why does Allah says, if you, why does Nuh say to them, plead forgiveness from your Lord? And he will send down abundant rains to you, and he will aid you with wealth and sons, and he will provide you with gardens, and he will provide you with streams, and so on and so forth. There's a very um, interesting connection here. What this shows us clearly is that uh, in order to receive Allah's blessings, we must submit to Allah. We must always be in a state where we are free from sin. The more we are free from sin, the more we um, attract uh, forgiveness from Allah. We know, for example, 
Now, let's try and understand this a little bit from a philosophical uh, perspective, okay? We know, for example, from many verses of the Quran that everything in the heavens and the earth is already in a state of submission to Allah, okay? And I'll give you, in the interest of time, I won't read all these, but I'll give you just some uh, verses to look at. And if you look at these verses, you will see for yourself that the heavens and the earth and the mountains, everything is in submission to Allah already. Okay? 41.11 okay, is a verse you could look at. Also, you could look at parts of 13.15. You could look at 17.44. Um, you could look at 1993, which is Surah Maryam. Okay. And what you will find in all these verses is that when Allah created the heavens and the earth, He called the mountains, He called the earth, He called the heavens and said, come willingly or unwillingly. And they said, we come willingly and in submission. Okay. And that everything in the heavens and the earth submits. The only creature that rebels is insan. Okay. So, what Allah has done, and it's a, it's a master plan really, He created us such that when we submit as well, we align ourselves with the rest of the creation. It's almost as if we begin to resonate with them at the same frequency. And by doing so, we are now on the same path with them, so the blessings and mercy and bounties of Allah come to us naturally. When we sin and we rebel, we sort of remove ourselves from that alignment. We, there is a misalignment, such that the blessings are there, but they don't reach us. Okay? And that is why you will find in many, many ahadith, for example, we're told that, um, and, and this is appropriate on the occasion tomorrow night being the 15th night of Sha'aban, we are told that when the final uh, uh, hujjah, Imam Sahib al-Zaman, ajallallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When he returns, we are told the earth will open up its blessings, right? We are told um, pillars of gold will be excavated from the earth. There will be so much wealth, people will not want the wealth. They'll be just lying by the roadside. Lots of rain, lots of food and vegetation. Hunger will be eliminated, disease will be eliminated. The earth will give out the best of its fruits and its blessings and all this we are told. Why will that happen? It will happen after the whole of mankind worships one God. There is submission. So it, it agrees completely with this idea. Okay? Um, some of the ulama explain this in a very interesting way. They say that Allah is the only reality. Every creature he created takes some of his attributes. Okay? And I've explained this many, many times in different lectures. I've said, for example, that as a human being sometimes, despite the fact that we might think we're very kind-hearted, we're very nice, sometimes we just lose our control and we display violence that even shocks us. We say something so hurtful or we we think such evil or uh, negative thoughts about a loved one, we surprise ourselves. I, I didn't know there was so much evil within me, right? We begin to realize that as an individual, I could just be a glorified animal. Any goodness that I see in me is actually from Allah and to the degree that I draw from that. Okay. There have been recent cases of mothers who have committed cruelty to their children. We normally symbolize as the perfect love is that of a mother for the child, isn't it? We talk about how a mother will sacrifice everything for her child. But you have been reading the news. Cases of mothers you know, putting their child in the car and driving into a lake and drowning with their children. Cases of starving children. Cases of cutting their children into little pieces. Right? All these sort of stories. What is happening here? As a human being, you might not see goodness in an individual. So when a mother is showing, or even a father, or anyone, when you are showing love to a child, that rahma that is coming from you, that is what you, based on how pure and ready your heart is, that is the amount of rahma you are drawing from Allah's attribute of being a rahim. To that degree, you are able to then manifest it on the rest of creation. 
Okay? And that is why we say the Imams are infallible, their knowledge is perfect, they have perfect wisdom, perfect this and all. Why? Because their capacity to draw is infinite. We have limitations. Okay? Based on this understanding, what the ulama say is that when we do istighfar, when we do tawbah, when we repent, when we turn, because tawbah literally means to turn around, to make a U-turn. Okay? So you do istighfar, you ask Allah to forgive you, then you do tawbah, you turn around, you face Allah now, before you had your back to him. Not that Allah is in a fixed location, but in the metaphoric sense, you now align yourself and submit to him. When you do that, you now begin to attract his attributes within you. The rest of the creation are only attracted to Allah's attributes. When they see those attributes in you, they come towards you naturally. When you lack those attributes, you block those blessings and that creation from coming to you. So it's as if when human beings surrender to Allah, when they, when they start drawing from Allah's uh, uh, um, attributes of mercy and kindness and love, they start becoming magnets <coughs> to the rest of the creation. They bring in the rain, they bring in the wealth, they bring in the children, they bring in the fruits. When they sin, they block themselves from taking those attributes. Now the rest of the creation will not come to mankind because there is nothing to attract them towards themselves. Okay? So this is just one example of how we could understand why Nu is saying this to them. To put it differently, when human beings rise to fulfill the purpose of their creation, then the whole universe begins to conspire in their favor. And that is why it is said every human being has a purpose in life. And we go through life looking for what our purpose is. The moment we find our purpose in life, amazingly all the right things begin to happen. All the connections begin to happen. All the right people in our, come into our lives. Things that seemed like it was a 20 step process becomes a two step process. Okay. The moment we start doing things that were not intended for us or the purpose in our life, we see obstacles after obstacles. It just becomes more and more difficult because we're going against the tide. And so other prophets also did the same thing and promised their people similarly. If you look at uh, chapter 11, verse 52, you see the prophet Hud salam, saying to his people, he says, O oh, my people, plead with your Lord for forgiveness. Then to him... Uh, penitently, he will send copious rains for you from your sky, from the sky, and add power to your present power. Okay. And if you look at uh, Dua Kumail as well that we recite on Thursday nights, uh, look at the opening verses where Amir al is asking Allah for forgiveness for different things. And you will see in that he, he, he says to Allah, Oh Allah, I ask you for forgiveness from those sins that block blessings from coming to me. I ask you forgiveness from those sins that stop my supplications from reaching you. I ask you forgiveness from, okay, so sin is what basically stops us from uh, benefiting from Allah. And the opposite is also true that when a person, uh, when, we, when we rebel, it also has an effect on the environment. All these things that we hear about now, we talk about global warming, about pollution, about tsunamis, about earthquakes. Uh, things just seem to be going out of whack, right? It is in part because of the rebellion and sin of human beings. And the more we sin, the more the earth will show its violence. Not as a punishment, but because of how we are connected, we cause that. Okay? Look at, for example, um, Surah Maryam, if you look at chapter 19, verse 88 to 91, and I'll let you review this at home on your own, but Allah talks about um, the Christians who attribute a son to God, which is a great sin in, in Allah's estimation. He says, the all-beneficent has taken a son, they say. They say, the all-beneficent, the Rahman, has taken a son. You have certainly advanced something hideous. Then he says, the heavens are about to be rent apart at it, and the earth to split open, and the mountains to collapse into bits that they should ascribe a son to the all-beneficent. 
That means they are about to do this. It is such a blasphemy that Allah says it is almost the heavens will fall apart. The mountains will crumble. What are they saying? It's just speech. But our speech reflects our beliefs, our inner state. Okay? And that has an effect. And then, of course, um, I have also spoken in other places about the miracle of water. Um, and that will be too much of a digression here. But how our thoughts, our speech has an effect on water. 70% of the world is water. 70% of our body is water. Uh, and when we think things and say things, how it affects our composition, the world, and so on and so forth. There's a whole discussion to this. Um, there is also uh, a very interesting verse, again, that I will, uh, I will leave you with these two verses as well. Verse 566, which is Surah Ma'idah, and verse 796, where Allah invites the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book. He says, if they had observed the Torah and the Injil, the Torah and the Evangel, and what was sent down to them from their Lord, they would surely have drawn nourishment from above them and from beneath their feet. And in the other verse it says about the polytheists in Mecca, if the people of the towns had been faithful and god weary, we would have opened up for them blessings from the heavens and the earth. Okay? So there is a, a very intimate bond between man and his environment, and Allah has created this to ensure that even though he gives man free will, whatever we do with our free will can only benefit us or can only harm us. So it's a master plan if you think about it. He says, I give you free will, but I tie your legs to the environment and to the world you live in. Now you do what you want, but anything you do will only harm you or benefit you. I will not have to interfere and punish you or reward you. You will decide yourself. Okay? Which is what he says in Surah Baqarah, for example, وَمَا ظَلَمُونَ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ They did not wrong us when they did wrong. They only wronged themselves. Okay. Um, look at also chapter 30, verse 41, that says, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ That corruption has appeared in the land and the sea because of what the hands of people have produced. Okay. Some of the ulama say that uh, when there's a drought and there's a special salat we pray called Salatul Istisqa, they say it is recommended to recite Surah Nuh when you pray Salatul Istisqa during droughts. And the reason is because of this verse where he says, يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا Okay. Now, here is the irony of the whole thing, that the people of Nuh were undergoing a drought, and I'm coming to a conclusion. Uh, Nuh tells them, if you repent, God will send rains for you. So they refuse to repent. So what does God do? He sends rains. But the only difference is he doesn't stop it. So they drown with the same rain that was supposed to be a blessing. Okay? The same rain that was supposed to be a blessing that was the cause of their drowning. And we shall see the same thing with the wealth and the children as well. That it was meant to be a blessing, but that shall be their curse. Uh, when we come to the next verse, uh, next week, inshallah. Um, I want to just uh, share a few um, ahadith uh, on this verse very quickly, and then I will open up to uh, your questions. Um, there we go. Um, on the subject of asking for forgiveness, uh, in a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, he said, plead forgiveness from your Lord frequently. For God, for Allah has taught you istighfar only because he wishes to forgive you. That is why he has taught you istighfar. In another hadith uh, from him as well, he said, one who is given the opportunity to plead forgiveness will not be denied forgiveness because Allah has said, istaghfiru rabbakum innahu kana ghaffara, this verse. In other words, if a person is wretched and does not deserve to be forgiven, 
it will not even occur to him to ask for forgiveness. If it occurs to you to say astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu sincerely, with thought, with attention, with humility, then it is only because Allah loves you and he wants to forgive you. For he is too generous to give you the thought and the opportunity to ask him and then not to accept that. Okay? If he brings you to the door and allows you to knock on the door, then he will open the door. If he does not want to open the door, you will not even think of going to that door. Okay? Um, there is a hadith as well um, from uh, um, Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, do istighfar, you will attract uh, sustenance. Um, there is a very interesting uh, hadith from uh, um, Imam, ha Imam Hassan alayhi salam, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It is said that uh, um, he was sitting one day in the mosque of the Prophet and a man came to him and said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I have a farm but there is a drought. Pray for me. So the Imam said to him, do istighfar. Then he went away, another man came. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I don't have any children, pray for me. The Imam said, do istighfar. A lot of istighfar. He went away. Another man came. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I don't have wealth, I'm poor. The Imam said, do istighfar. Another man came to him. He said, I, don't, I need uh, gardens or fruits or whatever. He said, do istighfar. They were different people. So when they went away, the, the, the companions around him said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, they came with all these different problems, but your prescription was the same. Do istighfar, do istighfar. Why? And the Imam, in a beautiful tafsir of these verses, he said, I did not take it from myself. I took it from the book of God. Do you not see? Allah says, وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِنْكُمْ يَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْأَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْأَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا It's all in this three verses. That that same istighfar will give you everything. Because it will align you with the blessings of Allah. And on this alignment, um, we have a hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he quotes from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli alayhi wa He says, when, when fornication increases, when zina increases, then sudden deaths will also increase in the world. Okay. Um, and from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, when fornication becomes widespread, then earthquakes will become more frequent. In other words, in the past as well, people used to commit zina, but they used to be ashamed of it. They used to hide it. They wouldn't publicize it. But when it becomes so open that it is accepted as normal, and you are the awkward one who believes it is wrong, right? then you will see earthquakes becoming widespread. And uh, there was an incident about this um, last year in, in uh, Australia. Uh, some of you may have heard about this. There was a scholar in Australia, and I think he was a Shia scholar. Um, he basically made a statement like this to say that the reason there's so many earthquakes um, is because uh, of so much adultery and fornication based on the hadith. And a group of non-Muslims ba basically made fun of this and laughed at it and said, you know, this is all a lie. And uh, they challenged him and they said, we're going to commit more fornication next Friday and let's see your God uh, no, astaghfirullah. What they said was, we're going to have a parade in public, and a whole group of us women are going to come out with mini skirts to promote basically this lifestyle. Okay, so they did that, and this was last year, and there was a tremor in that city in Australia. Okay, so when the media went to these women and said, didn't he just prove his point? He said, well, we don't believe in God, but now we believe in the power of the miniskirt. <laughs> you see, this is how fi qulubihim maradun fazadahumullahu marada. So God didn't cause the tremor, but the, they, are, they would rather believe that miniskirts can cause tremors, but not God. <laughs> okay? In any case, I have given you some uh, philosophical thoughts as well on how human beings have a place in the universe and how it's tied together. So we will continue from this next week. Now